Our guest is in Aberdeen, Scotland, the so-called oil capital of Europe. He's giving a talk on, quote, the future of energy in a time of uncertainty. Uh, he says the, the demise of oil and gas is greatly exaggerated, channeling Mark Twain there. We're joined now by Jason Schenker, president of Prestige Economics. Jason, thanks so much for coming on the show. Great to be here, Andy. What's the broad message that you're bringing to the people in Scotland? Well, there's a short-term message and a long-term message. In the short term, you know, there's concern about global growth. There's concern that inflation has plateaued and central banks will need to raise rates higher. But at the end of the day, in the U.S. especially, job numbers are still really good. There's a lot of open jobs. Wages are high. And that U.S. summer driving season, a big seasonal force for oil demand mm -hmm. in the world, likely to be record breaking this summer. So that's the short term. In the long term, there's a few key points. One is that the sustainability trends and pressures, those are going to increase over time. The second is that Cold War II and the conflict that the US, Canada, NATO and other allies are having with Russia and could have with China poses risks to the need for energy security. We see it in Europe. Mm -hmm. It also poses risks to battery supply chains and some of those critical materials and minerals that come out of China and Russia, which means even as we're looking for more electrification, even with the sustainability and net zero 2050 goals, means electrification isn't the only answer. There's going to be a number of different answers going forward and solutions. And oil and gas is going to remain a big part of especially the light vehicle consumption of energy for decades to come. So you guys, you say that you have copyrighted that phrase, Cold War II. Um, yeah. and, I mean, isn't it interesting? I mean, oil was an issue in the Second World War. Germany couldn't get it. Maybe that's one of the reasons they attacked the Russians. But um, it's, it's important. It, it's still important in the strategic balance. Well, and it's not just oil, too. We're thinking about, especially with electrification, it's also natural gas. And that's where Russia weaponized and exported its greatest weapon, the winter. Right? Natural mm -hmm. gas, cheap going into Europe, allowed Europe to make a very quick transition towards greener energies because they were relying on relatively inexpensive, much cleaner natural gas. But now those supplies have been shown to be insecure. You've got Germany and other countries now looking at more coal in order to make sure there's a balance in what's called the energy trilemma. Thinking about energy as being affordable, thinking about energy as being sustainable, right? We want to live in as clean a planet as possible, right? That's also important. And number three, which is, of course, it's secure. And as we see increases in electrification, even in ERCOT, the grid in Texas, that means we're going to need things like more CCGT peakers, combined cycle gas turbines, and that NAT gas, in order to make sure we can bridge some of the supply when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. So if you're an investor thinking about your portfolio for the next five or 10 years, should you have some oil and gas stocks in there? I think oil and gas is not going away. Natural gas especially is going to remain very, very important going forward as we see increased electrification. Oil's not going away either. And if we see, and we consider the biggest, most important thing, which is between 2020 and 2050, the global population is going to grow by more than 1.8 billion people. And those people don't show up on planet Earth with all the hydrocarbons you're going to need. <laughs> Right, <laughs> you know, but they are certainly going to want to drive around and when they flip the switch, they want to make sure the power is there. Electricity is consistent and stable. Those are going to be key issues that don't go away. I like that. We arrive on Earth with nothing and uh, we basically can't take anything with us, can we, when we leave? <laughs> <laughs> no, we cannot. What about, um, I mean, do you think there is going to be a major contraction in globalization? Are companies really serious about ensuring that vital materials are made in their home territory or at least by friendly allies? Are they really serious? Or, I mean, Western governments have basically let their industries, well, certainly in North America, allow their manufacturing sectors to wither for decades. 
it is definitely a priority for many companies across many industries right now. We see increased onshoring in the United States. The number of open manufacturing jobs is hundreds of thousands more than it had been at any other time in the last two decades. So there's a lot of manufacturing demand. You are seeing companies be more concerned, price in the risk that the tensions with China get worse, especially around dual use technologies. We think about the importance of the CHIPS Act. Those kinds of things aren't going away as a problem going forward. The question is, how bad will those trade tensions get? And if you need products and components that come out of China, what happens if the situation goes as sideways as the situation has gone sideways in Russia? Which means suddenly you have stranded assets and you can't get what you need. I wonder, are we moving towards a, a bipolar world, America and its European allies on one side, and then Russia and China and India on the other? I mean, that's a very broad strokes, but India, for example, is taking a lot of Russian oil. India, I think, is really trying to strike a balance, right? We think about one of the biggest themes around energy is that there's also a high degree of energy poverty on planet Earth. Yeah. Something like three quarters of a billion people don't have uh, energy they need and one and a half billion don't have clean cooking fuels. So I think India is trying to uh, be opportunistic in, in, in buying the oil wallets on the cheap, but I don't think they're committed to the political and geopolitical goals of China and Russia. I just think they're they're buying the oil wallets on the cheap given their economic situation. Yeah, I mean, India is an emerging superpower, and uh, superpowers sure. look after their own interests. That's really it. Uh, yeah, you can. And this, you know, and this year, Andy, India's population is going to surpass China's. And that means, really, they've got a lot of folks with a lot of energy demand. Their per capita GDP is still low. And there's a lot of upside for per capita wealth in India, which means that's going to be an increasing source of energy demand and fuels mm -hmm. demand, given that there's already energy poverty, but that their population is still growing, unlike China's, which is set to fall from here out. You have one phrase here. I, I, I find it a little depressing. We, we hear about this energy transition, but you think we're only in the transition, in the transition to the transition. Yes, that's right. I think that this is the decade where we're trying to figure out which technologies are actually going to be the ones that we can scale up to get us to net zero, where we manage the energy trilemma, where we make sure that energy is still affordable, that it is sustainable, and that it is stable and secure. And those three things that we're trying to balance, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. Obviously, we're trying to get to things like green hydrogen as fast as we can, but there are challenges around that, there are costs around that, there's scale around that, mm -hmm. and then there's infrastructure needs. So there's lots of different things that I think are going to be part of the solution for the future of energy. Some of it is certainly batteries and electrification, mm -hmm. especially for industrial and commercial vehicles, but it's also probably going to be blue and then green hydrogen, and we're going to see other solutions moving forward as well, especially carbon capture and sequestration and storage.